Hello students. Today I am going to explain chapter 2. We are not afraid to die if we can all be together. From the textbook Hornbill. Written by Gordon Cook and Alan East. This is a description of a voyage done by the narrator Gordon Cook and his family. It was their dream to duplicate the voyage done by Captain James Cook 200 years ago. They wanted to go on a round-the-world trip just like him, for which they spent 16 years of their life to prepare themselves for this sea voyage. Before moving on to the story, let's discuss the title of the story that is We are not afraid to die if we can all be together. That is said by the narrator's son Jonathan. While facing the difficult and hazardous situation during their voyage, it shows their extreme courage, determination, and togetherness. That means if we are united and if we have that courage to fight against any difficult situation, then we should not be afraid of dying or afraid of failing. The characters are the narrator himself, who is the captain. He is 37 year old businessman, his wife Mary, his 7 year old daughter Suzanne, his 6 year old son Jonathan and crew included an American Larry Vigil and a Swiss Herb Siegler. Look at this mind map of the story in which it is shown how the journey, how their sea voyage is covered in three different phases. First phase is round the world voyage means which tells how it began the second phase is about the attack of the big wave and all the difficult situations faced by the family and third phase deals with the ultimate victory let's begin the chapter now the narrator and his wife mary and two children jonathan and suzanne went on a voyage on their ship in july 1976 they started from Plymouth, England. They wanted to complete the sea trip around the world just like the one that had been completed 200 years ago by the famous Captain James Cook. The narrator and his wife spent 16 years improving their seafaring skills. They got a ship built professionally, a 23 meter long, 30 ton heavy wooden hull called Wave Walker. Here, wooden hull is used for wooden frame. They took several months to test it in the roughest of weathers. The initial phase of the three year long journey of 105,000 km passed very pleasantly. They sailed down the west coast of Africa to Cape Town. The narrator hired two crewmen before heading towards the east to tackle the roughest sea, the southern Indian Ocean. Their names were Larry Vigil, he was an American, and Herb Siegler, he was a Swiss. On the second day in Cape Town, they encountered a strong wind which continued for several weeks. A strong wind was not a problem, but 15 meters high waves, which were the height of the mast, worried the narrator. Mast is a tall upright structure on a boat or ship. On 25 December, they had traveled 3500 kilometers east of Cape Town. They celebrated Christmas together, despite the bad weather. The weather remained the same till New Year's Day, but they hoped for it to change soon. The weather conditions worsened. On the early morning of January 2, the waves were very huge, gigantic waves. They were sailing with a small storm jib at a speed of 8 knots. Here, knot is the unit of speed. When the ship was sailing with the huge waves, they could see the huge sea in front of them. The noise of the waves and strong winds was painful for their ears. They dropped the storm jib to slow down the ship and hit a heavy mooring rope across the back part of the ship in a loop. They lashed everything. Here, mooring means the ropes, chains or anchors to which a boat or with the help of which a boat or any ship is secured. They lashed everything with double force. Lashed means 
to hit something with a lot of force. They put on their oil skins and life jackets, attached lifelines and went through the life raft drills and waited. Here oil skins word is used for heavy cotton cloth waterproof with oil. Look at these difficult words. Around 6 p.m. an unpleasant silence rolled over. It was an indication of a disaster which was about to happen. The wind suddenly dropped and the sky was darker with heavy clouds. A huge cloud was coming towards the stern of the ship. Stern means the back part of the ship. But actually it was not the cloud. Later the narrator realized it was a huge wave. The wave was perfectly vertical and it was twice the height of the previous waves and looking unpleasant due to its height. Very soon the thunder increased and the waves moved the stern up. They thought that it would not do any damage but a huge explosion vibrated the deck. A strong moving stream of green and white water broke over the ship. The narrator's head smashed in the wheel. Smashed means just hit violently or shattered. He flew overboard and sank below the waves. He accepted that his death was approaching and started losing consciousness. He felt quite peaceful. The narrator's head popped out of water. The ship was about to overturn but a wave turned upright. His lifeline jacket was stretched. He grabbed the guardrails and sailed to the ship's main pole. The waves tossed him around the deck. He was injured and his left ribs cracked. His mouth filled with blood and he had a broken tooth. He found the wheel, lined the stern for the next wave and waited. There was water everywhere. The narrator could feel water below the ship but he did not leave the wheel alone because it was not safe. It was quite risky. Suddenly the front door opened and his wife Mary came screaming that they were sinking. They realized that they were sinking. She said, the decks are smashed. We are full of water. The narrator handed her the wheel and climbed towards the door. Here hatch is referred to the door. The crewmen Larry and Herb were pumping the water very fast. The timbers of the ship were broken and were hanging badly. The starboard of the ship had sunk. Clothes, crockery, charts, tins and toys, everything. Everything was roaming around in deep water. The narrator swam and crawled to the children's cabin and asked the children whether they were all right. The children replied yes. Sue, his daughter, complained about a big bump on her head. That shows that they were injured. The narrator didn't pay much attention to it as his major concern was to save them. The narrator found screws, hammer and canvas. He went back to the deck. The broken starboard. Starboard is the side of a ship which is on the right side when moving forward. So the broken starboard side was letting so much water in. If the narrator could not fix the problem, they would all sink in the sea. Look at these difficult words. The narrator stretched the canvas cloth and secured the waterproof hatch which covered the gaping holes. Some water streamed below and some was now deflected over the side. The hand pump was blocked as rubbish was floating around the cabins and entered it, due to which the electric pump short-circuited. As the water level rose, the narrator found two hand pumps had been removed along with a rope, jib, a small boat and the main anchor. He found another electric pump under the chart room. He connected it to an out pipe and it started working. The whole night was about the endless routine of pumping out the water, steering the wheel and working the radio. There were no replies to their signals sent over the radio as they were in the remotest part of the world. Sue's head was now more swollen and she had two back eyes with a deep cut in her arm. When upon being asked why she didn't tell him about her injuries earlier, she said that she didn't want to worry him as he was trying to save all of them. The water level was under control by the morning of January 3. So all of them took two hours rest in rotation. But there still was a leak somewhere below the waterline. 
and upon checking it was found that the boat rib structure was badly broken down till the base of the ship the whole section of starboard was held together with a few cupboard partitions the ship's condition was so bad that it would not make it till australia the narrator checked the charts and calculated that there were two small islands a few kilometers to the east one of them was isle amsterdam which was a french scientific base their only hope was to search and reach that island but only if the wind and the sea do not cause further damage else their chances were quite slim the wave had destroyed the ship's auxiliary engine after 36 hours of continuous pumping on january 4 the water was only a few centimeters left to be pumped out but they still had to pump out the water which was coming in they could not set sail on the main mast they hoisted the storm jib a triangular kind of flag and sailed towards the two small islands since they were not able to set the sail on the main mast the speed of their ship was too slow they had their first meal in two days some corn beef and cracker biscuits found by mary that was the first meal you can imagine their condition or the crucial days or the phase they were passing through the rest period was short lived as black clouds built up around 4 pm the wind was now 40 knots and the sea was getting higher means uh, they were able to see high waves the weather got worse and by the early morning of january 5 the situation was really bad when the narrator went to comfort his children in their cabin his son asked him whether they were going to die he tried to assure him that they would make it means they will surely they would surely get out of the difficult situation his son replied that they were not afraid to die till they all were together yes children uh, here the title of the story is justified because it was said by his son jonathan and he meant to say that as long as they were united and together they were not afraid to die they were ready to face the challenging situation and his words filled the narrator with a determination to fight back and gave him a lot of strength he made efforts to protect the weakened starboard side he used an improvised sea anchor made of heavy nylon rope and 22 liter plastic barrels of kerosene that same evening the narrator and his wife sat holding hands and they believed that their end was near the ship made it through the storm and by the morning of january 6 the narrator tried to get reading on the sextant sextant is an instrument which is used to get an idea of the position and it helps in navigation the narrator worked with wind speeds drift and current and calculated their position they were in 150000 km area of ocean looking for a 65 km wide island that means the island they were looking for was too small just like a pin prick in that large ocean which was 150000 km wide while the narrator was still thinking his daughter sue joined him and she was in pain the left side of her head was swollen and her blackened eyes had narrowed down to slits sue gave him a card which she had made herself on the front of the card was a cartoon image of her parents with words written about them being funny people and how they made her laugh on the inside of the card she told them how she loved them both and she thanked them this made the narrator realize that they had to make it to the island that was a sweet gesture by sue to express her gratitude to her parents for being supportive and for being the best parents she could ever have and that eventually motivated the narrator to put in all his efforts to reach the island the narrator rechecked his calculations they lost their main compass and were using the spare one which was not corrected for magnetic variations he estimated the influence of the westerly currents which flow through the indian ocean around 2 pm he went on deck and asked larry 
to steer the wheel to 185 degrees. He felt if they were lucky, they would see the island by 5 p.m. Then he went below and slept. After that, he woke up around 6 p.m. and it was dark outside. He thought that they might have missed the island. He started worrying about how they would tackle the westerly wind more as the ship wasn't capable to sail more. His son came and asked him for a hug. His daughter also followed him. Tousled head means disarranged hair of the narrator's son. Bunk is used for a bed and dozed off means went off to sleep. The narrator asked his son why was he getting a hug. His son replied that he was the best daddy in the world and also called him the best captain. The narrator replied that he was afraid. Sue told him that they had found the island which was as big as a battleship. The narrator rushed to the deck and gave a sigh of relief. They could see the complete outline of Isle Amsterdam. There was a bleak piece of volcanic rock in front of them. It had a little vegetation. It was the most beautiful island in the world. They moored the ship at some distance from the shore. They moored the ship means they secured their ship with the help of any chain or rope. They moored the ship at some distance from the shore and the next morning, 28 inhabitants of the Amsterdam island helped them to move on the shore of the island. As he felt the land again on his feet, he thought of his crewmen and his wife. He also thought of his 7-year-old daughter who was injured badly. She had to go through 6 minor operations to remove the blood clot in her head. His son, who never gave up, and was not afraid to die. That means after reaching the island, Isle Amsterdam, the narrator thought of everyone who supported him in coming out of that difficult situation. At the same time, he also realized that it would not have been possible without the support of his family and such feeling of togetherness. This is the end of the story. To sum up, we can say the story is all about the determination and togetherness of a family that defied all the odds and torturous weather to achieve a nearly impossible feat. Their courage and love for each other helped them survive.